Welcome everybody. And my name is Mika Perks and um, Jennifer Song is the Laura Martin with glasses and gorgeous long gray hair in, I don't know where she's on your screen, but I'll, you wanna say hi, Jennifer? Hi. That's Jennifer. And we're both, um, we are both fiction writer. Well, um, we teach fiction writing um, and the creative writing program at UCSC. And tonight we wanted to talk to you all about the craft of um, Tommy Orange is There, There. Um, and we wanna hear what you all have to say as well. And um, we, the way it's gonna work is that um, I'm gonna talk for a little bit about um, a particular aspect of the craft of There, There. And we'll do a little creative writing exercise. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer and she'll do the same. And um, I also wanted to just let you know or invite you to um, use the chat to talk to each other, to make comments. Um, maybe when I'm um, doing mine, Jennifer, you could be the host of the chat. And then maybe when Jennifer's doing hers, I'll, I'll be the host of the chat in terms of um, if people have questions, we can bring them up. Um, and that's it. And then we'll, let's see how it goes. And we're, we're eager to hear your thoughts about um, craft too. I, before we get started, I wanted to um, thank the real Laura Martin and the real Irena Pollock for, and everybody else at Humanities Institute for Organizing the Deep Read. Thank you so much. And then I also just wanted to remind you that this is just the start of the salon. So, um, and I'll, um, uh, maybe somebody could put it in the chat if they want to, but um, on Wednesday, February 24th, so um, that's next week at 5.30 p.m., um, Professor Mayanthi Fernando, Katie Kalia, and Gina Ramirez will participate in a salon-style conversation about the novel, and those are anthro professors. Uh, is that, I think so. Um, and then on Thursday, February 25th, also at 5.30, you'll get the chance to discuss the novel with members of the Amamutsan tribal band, the indigenous tribe native to the Santa Cruz region. So um, those are really exciting. And then of course, on Wednesday, March 3rd um, at 6.30 is our actual event with Tommy Orange. So that should be super exciting as well. Um, hold on, I'm gonna close my window. Even though there's great music playing on the street. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the craft techniques. Nika. Uh, yeah. But aren't I going to introduce you first? Oh, you don't. Oh, okay. Yeah. Introduce me. Okay. Mika Perks is the author of two novels, a collection of link stories and a memoir. Her research interests, which we wouldn't necessarily mention if they weren't so interesting, include US fiction, autobiographical writing and historical fiction, US gender, literature and culture, alternative communities, US wilderness adventure writing, magical stories and humorous stories. Herself, adventurous, magical, funny and much loved, the director of creative writing at UCSC, her novella, The Great Naked and Afraid Baking Show is forthcoming on Plasher's Solos. Oh, thanks. Welcome, Vigo Kirk. Thank you, Jennifer, that was so sweet of you. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about there, there. So if you think about um, what are the kind of defining characteristics of there, there, I think immediately we think of the many point of views, right? So there's, um, some people, some critics count 16 different point of views in there, there. Um, if you include the prologue point of view and the interlude point of view, which are actually, if you read them carefully, they're pretty different in voice, the, the two different, the interlude and the point of view and the um, prologue. And so a, a real defining characteristic of there, there is those many voices that are braiding in and out. Um, and, to me, what one thing that's, so there's so many characters and one thing that's really uh, exciting to me about um, the novel is that all, to me, all of the characters are really complicated um, 
full people, full characters, rather than um, what we call, you know, in creative writing, flat. They don't feel like stereotypes. They don't feel flat. They don't. They don't feel like walking um, mouthpieces for the author. They feel like real people in their own right. And so I wanted to think a little bit about how does Tommy Orange do that. Um, and I wanted to think about it through um, the creation. I wanted to follow a little bit the creation of my personal favorite character, who is Opal Viola Victoria Bear Shield. Um, so I was, I was thinking about how does Tommy Orange create this character that makes me feel so in love with her. Um, and I, I wanted to talk to you about a few things, a few kind of tricks or masterful things that Tommy Orange does to thicken and make real and make um, full and complicated Opal's character. So some of the things I wanted to point out to you is that um, he reveals secrets about her. He describes her physically and metaphorically. He describes her at different ages and he describes her from several different point of views. So for, okay, so first I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the point of views. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about the novel is that we see, um, we see Opal both from the inside and from the outside. So from the outside, her grand, when we're in her grandson Orville's point of view, and by point of view, I mean who's, who's um, telling the story. Um, so when Orville is telling the story from when it's from his character's point of view, he calls her quote, a big old lady. And he says he's afraid of her. And then when we're in Opal's sister, Jackie's point of view, she describes Opal as static, sober, stoic. And, and in, in another times, the narrator says that a medical professional would call her, quote, overweight. Um, and then another physical description from the narrator um, says she got big to avoid shrinking. She chose an expansion over contraction. Opal is a stone. So there we see this vision of Opal as static, sober, stoic, a big old lady. So this sense of her a stone. So this sense of her as um, really solid, really you know a stone. What are that? What are the aspects of a stone? Right, cold, strong, solid. But we as readers get to see Opal from the inside. We see her as a uh, a really vulnerable and frightened young girl on Alcatraz um, and when she loses her uh, mother and then loses her sister. And we, we are also in this, in, when she's an adult and a postal carrier, we're inside her head again in what's called, so, so when she's, um, when we see her as a young child, we're in first person, you know, I do this, I do that. And then when she's an adult, we see her in what's called third person limited. So we see her, it's, it's inside her head, but we're using, but Tommy Orange is using third person. So he'll say, Opal thinks this or Opal feels this, but we're still, it's a very close lim third limited. So we're really filtering everything through her, um, through her vision or her personality. So we look, so in that personality, we learn her secrets. We learn that she's much more complicated than just stoic. Uh, what, what was the, what was that that his sister says? Static, sober and stoic a big old lady. She actually, we learn all these secrets about her. Like for example, when we meet her, when she's a little girl, um, Tommy Warren shows us how close and important her mother and her sister are to her, not by telling us, not by saying my mother and sister are really important to me, but we see the way that she, um, she acts with them. He shows us details. Like for instance, he says, or she tells us, on the bus, I moved closer to my mom and put a hand into her jacket pocket. So that gesture, that physical gesture of intimacy, like who would you feel comfortable in the world putting your hand in their pocket, right? There aren't that many people in the world you would feel close to like that. Um, and also in a very similar interesting gesture, um, the, at the end of that section, the sister, well, all through that section, we see the sisters leaning into each other, bumping heads, laughing. So they have this real physical intimacy. And the last few lines of that section, they're holding hands. And the last line is, they don't let go. So that, again, that physical intimacy of hand holding, 
or using your hand to connect yourself to another person shows us how close they are, makes it even more devastating when we find out that Opal has lost these people. We also know, um, Opal also tells us the secret, tells the reader the secret that she's scared that she killed somebody in, to um, defend her sister. And she, and, um, she says that she, or through her person, through her vision, we see that she carries the weight of him. So she carries the weight of that loss. That's a secret weight that she carries and she doesn't tell anybody until later in the novel. Um, also a kind of fun secret is that we find out when she's a grandmother that she's always snooping into her grandchildren's things and that she believes that they, she believes that people are basically kind of evil <laughs> and that she needs to like root out their evil ways. And she's always checking their phones and checking through their things when they're not around. Um, another really extraordinary detail is that we find out that when she was little, and there was a bump on her leg and spider legs. She found spider legs inside her body. And that's a kind of almost magical or mystical um, connection also with her grandson who also when he's, um, he, that happened to him as well. Uh, so, so that's something, that idea of something, uh, a spider emerging from her body is a really intense secret. She does tell Jackie that. And then we even were so close to her that we even learned secrets that she hides from herself. So that that in, that very, very close um, third limited that is so close that we're even underneath her own eye voice, right? So um, Tommy Orton says, she lives by a superstition she would never admit to. It's a secret she holds so close to her chest she never notices it. She lives by it like breathing. So, those are just saw a couple of ways that um, I think Tommy Orange really masterfully thickens up this character and makes her feel very real and very sympathetic for us and very close to us as readers. So I thought maybe we could do a creative writing exercise using, if you'll bear with me, I'll share my screen and um, so that you can see this exercise. I'll just share it for a minute. Um, so if we look at here, I'm going to just read to you how Tommy Orange describes Opal when she's an adult. He says, and I've, I've read part of this to you already, Opal is large. If you want to say bone structure wise, that's fine, but she's big in a bigger sense than big bodied or bone structure wise. She would have to be called overweight in front of medical professionals, but she got big to avoid shrinking. She'd chosen expansion over contraction. Opal is a stone. She's big and strong, but old now and full of aches. So just to start out, can you um, just do a very short description of a character? This could be a real person you know, or it could be you could just invent someone on the spot, or it could be if you're a writer, um, it could, you could pick a character that you're already writing about. Um, so just give us, just in the way Tommy Orange very, that was just literally five sentences. So just in a few sentences and not worrying too much about how fancy it is, just write down um, a description of a character. And then it's fine if you haven't finished that yet, but once you have finished that, name a secret this character keeps to themselves. What would be a secret that the character doesn't tell anybody? And then when you've thought of that, name a secret, this is a harder one, name a secret this character holds so close to their chest, they
they never notice it? What is a secret they even keep from themselves? And then to finish up, I wanted to play with this sentence that I think is so beautiful that Tommy Orange writes about Opal. He wrote, Opal is a stone, but there is troubled water that lives in her that sometimes threatens to flood, to drown her, rise up to her eyes. So let's, let's play around with that sentence and see if you can write a sentence about your character copying Tommy Orange's syntax. So whatever the name of your character is, like say your character's name is Sam. Sam is a what? Opal's a stone. What noun would Sam be? But there is some kind of something is inside of that of Sam. And this threatens to do what to Sam? To rise up to their eyes. Okay, just to look again at, at Tommy Orange's sentence. Opal is a stone, but there is troubled water that lives in her that sometimes threatens to flood, to drown her, to rise up to her eyes. Hi, everybody back again, all the Laura Martins. Um, does anybody feel like uh, reading any, of, any part of what you wrote? Oh, here's one, someone put it in the, in the chat, um, one of the Laura Martins. E is an arc in a flood, but there is a rainbow that lives in her. And this threatens to burst out, to rise up to her eyes. Oh, that's beautiful. E is an arc in a flood, but there is a rainbow that lives in her. And this threatens to burst out, to rise up to her eyes. Thank you. Does anybody else wanna put theirs in the chat? He is a fly, but there is a swat. Oh, I'm sorry. He is a fly, but there is swat that lives in him. And this threatens to break his wings in front of all who shrug him off. That's a great one. Anybody else? Can I try? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. He is sunshine. He is light shining so bright. It covers the darkness deep within that he carries from his worst days. Although he has made amends, he feels it is not enough. Instead of indulging the guilt and remorse, he chooses to shine as bright as he can and warm others with his smile. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. That line, that line he sh um, about how it's never enough, that really, that was really intense. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do that. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, here's one down here. Cynthia is a butterfly, but there is an ocean of compassion that lives in her. And this threatens to overwhelm her, to rise up to her eyes. Oh, I love that. I love how 
the, the incredible tension between a butterfly and an ocean that they're so different from each other. Very cool. Okay, well, that's something that you might wanna think about um, as you're reading along is just sort of notice as you're reading or thinking about the book, um, the way that characters are being portrayed and how, um, how Tommy Orange is showing them to us. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Jennifer Tsung, but before I do, I get to um, introduce her a little bit more formally, but a little lot, I have to be honest, less formally than she introduced me. That was very fancy. Um, I was just gonna say that um, Jennifer Tsung is a, um, this is her first year as an assistant professor of fiction writing here at UCSC. And she, even though it's just her first year, she's already the author of many books and she's a poet. She's an award-winning poet, an essayist and a novelist and a short story writer. And I have here, I just wanna show this to you. This is her novel, Mayumi and the Sea of Happiness published by Europa Editions. When I first read this, it just absolutely blew me away and I had to have her come to UCSC and um, you should all read it. If, you know that you know when they um, she, it contains almost all my interests right here in this book. All right, Jennifer, you go. Every time I do that, the queen of speaking on mute. Hi, everybody. It's really exciting to see so many people out for the deep read of Tommy Orange. As just someone who's teaching literature and doing almost a book of a day, I'm mean, not a book a day, a book per week in my class, I feel this intense envy of how close we get to get to the text. So it was a luxury. I decided to stick with um, Mika's favorite character, Opal, and do a little bit more, a closer read of her. Um, one of the things that intrigues me most in fiction is the use of objects. And the writer, Laura Van Denberg once said, the right object appearing at the right time can transform a moment, a scene, a story. The meaning of objects is relational. They are shaped by the context they exist in and they can reshape contexts in turn. And Tommy Orange often pairs his characters with an object and he does so beautifully. So I thought I would do a close reading of an object that's important to Opal. And just to try to give you a sense of the potential that objects hold. So I'm gonna be looking at passages between um, 46 to 58 if you wanna follow along. As you may recall, so when Opal and her mom and her sister set off for Alcatraz, all she packs into that scuffed up red duffel bag is two outfits and her teddy bear, two shoes. So two shoes is part of the old life that Opal brings with her when they leave. And as they say goodbye to the house, he becomes a kind of emblem of her past. And like, like Opal and like everyone in her family, the bear has a name and a history. His name comes from Sister Jackie's bear one shoe. Um, on page 46, Opal feels some confusion about her own name. I didn't understand this explanation about dads and I didn't know if bear shield meant shields that bears used to protect themselves or shields people used to protect themselves against bears or were the shields themselves made out of bears. And similarly, she isn't quite sure whether her bear's name Two Shoes should be a source of pride or shame or something else. So the bear is not just an emblem of the past, he's also a kind of mirror for Opal. And Orange doesn't stop there. On, so on page 57, they get on the bus and you know Jackie sits away from them, in Opal's words, like she didn't know us. And Opal wants to talk to her mom. Of, you know, she wants to find out more about the island, but she knows that her mom doesn't like talking on the bus. She says of her, she turned like Jackie, like we didn't all know each other. So there in the company of her mother and her sister, Opal finds herself alone with no one to talk to. And then even later on when Opal does talk to her mother, she doesn't really know what her mother's talking about. On 48, she says, 
My mom was like that, speaking in her own private language. So not only does Opal feel estranged from her mom and sister, but when they arrive on the island, Jackie finds friends much more easily and she goes off with them. And Opal is left alone again. So on the day that her mom sends her out to look for Jackie, Opal says, I didn't wanna go out there alone. So she brings two shoes and he completely transforms the narrative. Now she has someone to talk to. They talk about being Indian and bear, and he's at once an extension of Opal and someone who teaches her things. So the bear is never a static object that only does one thing. He's totally dynamic, operates in multiple ways. When he tells Opal the story of his name, the story about Roosevelt, he becomes separate from her, just another person keeping her company and he's a presence that draws out a side of Opal we haven't seen. So he changes her even as he is her. So objects like two shoes are these just mysterious forces that can bring more emotion and weight into a story. And amazingly, two shoes doesn't just change the story he's in, he changes the story outside the story that the common image of a cozy teddy bear has this story of a president slitting its predecessor's throat. Behind it raises this question, how many other things are there in the world that aren't as they seem? So on page 52, Opal finds Jackie. She says, then two shoes went quiet. That's the way it was with him. He either had something to say or he didn't. I could tell by what kind of shine I saw in the black of his eyes, which one it was. I put two shoes behind some rocks and headed down to my sister. So not only can an object be an emblem of an idea, reflect a character, be an extension of a character, an object can also help ground a narrative. So when Opal sets two shoes behind those rocks, the rocks become more real to us. And later when she learns that everything is a lie and that her mother has cancer, she remembers that she left him there and she goes back to retrieve him. And so here the bear acts as a tool of transition. You know, he helps move her from one scene and into another. On page 58, she says, when I got to Two Shoes, he was on his side and in bad shape, like something had chewed on him or like the wind and salt had dimmed him down. I picked him up and looked at his face. I couldn't see the shine in his eyes anymore. I put him back down where he'd been, left him like that. So in the final image, Two Shoes has changed again. The fact that he has been roughened by the elements, mirrors what Opal has been through, because she too has been chewed up and dimmed down. And there's this kind of reversal too, whereas, you know, this time, instead of bringing a part of herself with her, she leaves a part of herself behind. And Two Shoes is both transformed by the story and transforms it. And I think the most powerful objects are like this. They're not simply static reflections of the character, but they're dynamic, they're transformative, and they're mysterious and yet also grounding. So I do invite you to give your character an object, but I also, especially with this book that has so many different voices, it feels appropriate that we can hear from as many people as possible. So I have some questions that I can, you know, a question to start off with, but if you, there's something that you really want to talk about, feel free to ask your question as well. Um, I guess my first question is, since this is the craft talk, I'm curious if there are any other elements, craft elements that really stood out to you in this book, like things that you admired, things you want to steal from, learn from. 
Yeah, or even like, what did you, what, when you think about this book and you're describing it to someone else, what, um, how would you describe it? What are its elements that really stick out for you? You can, you can raise your little hand, your little electronic hand, or you can, well, oh, here's one, the usage of time shift. Oh, Jennifer, you have to take that, talk about that because time is your thing. I do. <laughs> I so this is what I didn't understand are the I thought we were discussing it I, I definitely am not the expert on this novel so I don't have all the answers um well why don't we ask Anne then Anne Neeland what 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 it, can you talk a little bit about the usage of time shift what do you notice about that Well, something I've noticed in a lot of native narratives is that time moves without direct commentary, really. They move from one area of time to another in a sort of this is what is, not necessarily its past. But there is... Um, there is there are, there are things like that throughout so many of um, cultural occurrences in um, lots of indigenous um, practices. So I think that um, in this book, time is almost like not exactly a character, but it's something that is. Uh, I don't know. It's it's hard to put a finger on it exactly. It's it shifts um, beautifully from one stage to another. Yeah, one of the Laura Martins puts it as nonlinear time. Which, yeah, that's a really interesting. Right. That's a really interesting description of it. Do other people? One of the Laura Martins. Do um, does do other people when you're reading that novel? When you're reading Tommy Orange's novel, do you there there? Do you feel like? Um, if the time is nonlinear, does it feel that it's not moving forward? How does it feel to you? Yeah, who is the, there's a lot of great questions happening. So here someone said time is circular or spherical. It's interesting for me. Tell me about this. Am I, do I have this? I felt like Maybe it happens after the interlude, but at least after the interlude, I felt like time was kind of rushing towards the powwow and like a kind of inexorable um, speeding up towards this, what we think, what we kind of have a sense is not gonna go well, or is gonna, there's something bad's gonna happen there. And that we're in the, I felt like the chapters got shorter and shorter the closer we got to the powwow. And so there was a sense of like very actually propulsive narrative drive towards the powwow that did feel, didn't feel nonlinear to me. It kind of felt pretty linear, but maybe, maybe other people see it. Obviously other people see, oh yeah, someone says a funnel, definitely like a funnel, yep. Oh, here's someone said, um, one, one of Irina Pollock said, it gives a sense of now and again, now and again, now. No, wait, I missed it. <laughs> a lot like a spider's web, networked, but it jumps around, maybe a spiral. Yeah, mm. that's really, yeah, there's, well, definitely the relationship with all the characters is like a network or spider web, right? The way they're all connected. Some of them literally gen genetically connected, some of them emotionally connected. Uh, uh, can I say something real quick? Oh, oh please. Uh, with Laura. the whole time thing, <laughs> uh, with the whole time thing, I've been thinking a lot about why the chapters are in the order they are, yes. because uh, narrative-wise, since time is kind of happening all at once and side by side, there's has to be a different reason the narrative structure for the orders of the chapter. And what I've been trying to figure out is why was Tony's story first? Because yes. for that first portion of the novel when the narrative hasn't really taken place you could reshuffle the chapters and the story would be the same so why do we start on tony i love that question does it do you have an answer for that i don't i've been trying to figure it out which is why i was excited to come here and ask it to see what you, uh, what other people thought what what do other people think i, I love that question 
In fact, I might, maybe I should actually ask Tommy Orange that when, Orange that when he comes. Why do we start with Tony Lohman? Um, anybody question, anybody have an answer to that? Or a guess? I mean, we end with him too, right? Yeah. So he's like this bookend. I don't know, I'm trying to think about that too. We're talking about this in the class um, too, like the, the question that you asked the order and when when we go back and, you know, cause there's recursiveness too. And maybe that's connected to the time question. There's like a recursiveness. Yeah. Um, maybe. With the characters. Can I say something? Yeah. And that is, and this is, I don't want to use the intentional fallacy, but it may be for Tommy, I, the writer, Tommy Orange, that that was an aspect of that character he felt very close to emotionally. And that was a good way for him to enter into the mo movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, in some ways I was more, I love that that question was so interesting to you about Tony Loneman. I didn't even think about, I was, um, for me the, the prologue, starting with a prologue, which is something not common in late 20th, early 21st century or 21st century contemporary fiction and ha also having the interlude. Um, I was really struck by that as the beginning of the book and, and also the difference between the two voices, like in the voice in the prologue, um, when he's when the narrator is recounting the atrocities that happened, and for example, in King Philip's War, he writes in these really simple sentences, like, um, uh, you know, in the way that writers often use um, when they're talking about something very dramatic. So this happened, then this happened, then this happened, right? It has this sense of um, very intense, violent, direct, understated sentences, and then when he's in the interlude, there's the, the we voice and it's this completely flowing, um, connected, um, lyrical, moving forward, moving down the page, very diff completely different voice and different perspective too. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Oh, there's, there's someone saying something about Tony. Tony is a kind of innocent because of, oh, Things keep moving. Tony is a kind of innocent because of his disability and being a victim of fetal alcohol syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. And someone else is saying um, that Tony and Octavio discuss their grandmothers, they're present, connected to the past, which I was also thinking of maybe that's why we start with Tony Loman, who he's he's a lone man. He's alone, but you, all he has to do is look in the mirror to see the ghosts of his past. And so he too is connected by the past even when he's just in his own body in undeniable way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most vulnerable, hmm. what do you mean by that? Uh, he seems so much more um, affected by those around him because he doesn't come with as many skills. He's left, he's, he's in a position where uh, he doesn't have the skill set that, that a lot of the people around him have. And it puts him in a vulnerable place and a place of ignorance that, that, that we right away rush to, to protect. But, but maybe in another way, um, maybe in another way, there's orange is setting up right from the beginning. There's this uh, kind of a stereotypes or cliches around um, fetal alcohol syndrome babies or people who are born with fetal alcohol syndrome and with the way that he, it's kind of like opal too, you know, so how, what, how does he appear from the outside to people? And then who is he in the inside and giving him like a very complicated inner life and a complicated humanity. And then that way um, he's, he's kind of exploding cliches and stereotypes of a certain kind of um, person. So, and maybe he, I, in that way, he's setting the novel up for us. Like 
people are not going to be who, the, who you think they are, who they are look like from the outside. Precisely. I think that um, he is, um, I think he's presented where he is. He has a clarity. And also he, he says, uh, he's talking about his mom. And um, she told me my dad's over in New Mexico that he doesn't even know I exist. Tell then, then tell that motherfucker I exist, I said to her. Tony, it ain't simple like that, she said. Don't call me simple. Don't fucking call me simple. You fucking did this to me. I think that's like a, a huge statement about where he comes from, what he knows. And um, you fucking did this to me. I, I mean, to me, he... He may appear, I don't think he's a victim at all. I think he's got things he's got to overcome. But um, the idea that it's at the beginning and at the end, um, maybe he's the only one that really knows um, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I love it how people are saying kind of diametrically opposed ideas about him. Some saying he knows everything. Some saying he's um, innocent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what about were there other characters that people felt either had strong feelings about um that you felt either very connected to or you thought were mysterious or do um some people have thought that different characters might be kind of avatars for the author Yeah, I'd love to hear this too, because I was sort of caught off guard when Mika said, oh, let's do, I want to do Opal because she's my favorite character. And I realized that I didn't have a favorite character. And I usually resist those kinds of books that have the cast of characters at the beginning, because it's hard for me to keep track. But I really feel like I accepted all of them. But I'm curious if other people have favorites too. But it was really hard to keep track, wasn't it? Like, I, I felt, I don't know if you, I don't know if you felt that way or not, Jennifer, or other people, but I did have to keep flipping back to the beginning. I'm so glad he put the cast of characters at the beginning, and I'd be like trying to remember who's attack, who's connected to who, and in what way. It was really a challenge. So Dean's a favorite. Oh yeah, why is for the person who said that Dean or is their favorite? How come? You can put in the chat if you want. Oh, because they're storyteller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think someone had said in the comments for the just the general deep read on that website um, that they felt that Dean was the most likely kind of avatar for Tommy Orange. Because mm -hmm. he wanted to learn everybody's stories. Yeah. And he was making a documentary. Yeah. Yeah, and that the book was a kind of stood in for that. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and he wants he wants everybody to tell their to tell their stories and um, just tell yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did what did you think, Jennifer, about about the one of the things that, or other people too, about all the, there were so many, the pattern. So definitely he was an important person who was making a documentary and really wanting to ca capture everybody's stories. Um, and, um, but there were so many metaphors for storytelling and novel making. It was actually a really metafictional, you know, a book that that's about storytelling and about writing. Um, in a lot of ways or about making uh, artistic production and and the telling of stories did um just over and over metaphors for that um that was really mm. interesting. oh so here somebody says tommy orange spent a lot of years collecting other people's stories for a paid job oh that's so interesting does any could anybody tell us more about that yeah, Opal's Bad is called Story, yeah. Um, 
I was listening to a podcast from about a year and a half ago, and he was saying that one of his jobs was he worked for some kind of story project for a long, long time. And he was stating the way he put a little bit of himself into all the various characters, well, not all of the characters, but he mentioned that none of the characters were based on anybody. If anything, they were just based on him. Like for instance, this spider leg thing actually happened to him. Mm -hmm. He found two spider legs and he said, you know, like he added three for a dramatic effect. <laughs> That's great. Really interesting. So that so maybe that makes sense then that um, Dean uh, is well. May, I guess as he's saying, they're all kind of avatars of him. So that's interesting too. Did you think? Yeah. So yeah, they all have little bits of him. That makes sense as of course as well. Yeah, because the 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 uh, author, the person moderating the interview, whatever, had asked him, um, you know, did were anyone based on a grandmother? Was anyone, you know, like? And he said, no, they were like created from from whole cloth. I mean, from mm -hmm. his imagination, or you know, everyone always says that. Yeah, <laughs> they're talking about a book I read, Rose. <laughs> um, okay, so um, Jennifer, do you have more questions for us? Maybe we should move on to a different aspect. Uh, sure. I have so many questions. Um, oh, you do. Where's my page? I, I have actually too many questions is my issue. This happens to me in class as well. Um, well, uh, one thing that interests me, and it's not it's not exactly a craft thing, but, um, but I, although there's a way in which it could be, you know, somebody had mentioned in the comments that there are so many more male characters than female and that they were having trouble keeping track of the male characters. And I guess I was just curious if anyone might speculate about why that might be. And also if you noticed anything about his treatment of men and women. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Anybody? Either in the chat. Oh, oh, someone wrote, yeah, definitely. There's lots of missing fathers. Absolutely. And, but there's actually missing mother too. Um, two missing, um, both Opal and Jackie's mother and Jackie is also uh, goes missing in a way too. What did, what did you think about? What did you think, Jennifer? In terms of the gender um, descriptions? I mean, I kept, I guess, of course, I'm thinking from a writer's perspective that you might tend to write more of the character that's easier for you or that you relate to. So, um, but I thought it was interesting that there are so many men, but it seemed to me that the few women that were there were really voices of authority. Like they seem to hold a lot of the power in the book. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I was interested in that. And I was just curious if anyone else noticed that or had any observations. Um, Anne says a lot of heavily gendered commentary on adaptation to trauma. That's interesting. Yeah, and then men, women, two spirit is, is another question. I mean, I didn't, in my reading of the book, it truly was a kind of woman born as quote unquote female and quote unquote male. And I wasn't seeing a lot of in between, but I could have missed it. I did hear, um, I have read some commentary, you know, that there aren't just people noticing that there aren't any, um, that there aren't any queer characters or gay characters, or at least obviously not. Oh, somebody's asking about, this is another question, although I would have phrased it differently, but um, someone says, why did he have to end the book with such a sad and violent event? I realized it was a theme of the book as all the characters were heading toward the powwow. And, and another way to think of it too, is just in a more general way is why does the book end the way it does? I'm, I'm really interested in what people think about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, first of all, it, it all, 
I mean, this, the whole, like, like I mentioned this before, but for me, it really does feel like it's moving towards this big moment where all these characters who've been separated are all in one place at one time. So how, that's kind of like a very, it's a very literary thing happening, right? Like all the different voices and then they all converge at the end in the same place in the same time. And they're, and, and literally all their lives are at stake, right? So um, there's, this, there's this high drama um, at the end of the book. So, uh, someone said it ends like that because it's an Oakland story. What does that mean? Uh, the, I think that one way I look at the book, I live in Oakland and the book is just so unbelievably grounded in Oakland. If you live in Oakland, it just has an immediacy, all the events, the streets he names, the corners. And it just has that whole sense of um, the uh, mishmash that Oakland is, which, you know, if you live in Oakland, it's a violent city. And there's a lot of violence in it. And there's a certain, there's, there's a sense of a community and being grounded in that. And there's also a sense that that community can be propulsively putting you into very dangerous places. And it just pervades the whole book. And I, I mean, the title of the book is about Oakland. You know, mm. to me, it, it is one of the great Oakland novels. Mm. Very specific. Mm -hmm. Right, and, some, and someone said here, there's also a lot of nonviolence and uh, I lost that unsafety in Oakland. Yeah, right. And so we, there, I think absolutely true that there's a lot of violent moments in the novel, but also a lot of moments of connection and kindness and generosity. And even at the powwow, there's a lot of connections that happen and, um, and afterwards too. So it's not, it's not all one way or the other, definitely. And so oh, here's, here's, to know. Oh, yeah. go no, you go, Jennifer. Oh, just literary devices aside, someone wants to know, did people like the book? Yeah, that's an interesting one question. <laughs> just be simple just, yet crucial. He's not in the room. So, loved it. Somebody, one of the Laura's loved it. A lot of the Laura's loved it. Yeah, I saw somebody, yeah. Seven oh. out of 10, I wanna know more about that. Loved it, it was great, liked it, loved it, loved it, loved it. I thought, oh, here's an interesting one. I thought it was good, but I could tell it was a first novel. Oh, here's someone said I didn't like the book. Um, I'd love to hear about, someone said I agree with Laura, which is a funny comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, who, said, who said, or does anybody want to amplify the idea that it felt like a first novel? That's a really interesting question, comment. What's a first novel sound like that's different from a second novel or a third novel? Anybody? Uh, to me, it felt like there were parts where the author um, was trying to find a voice, but was kind of struggling to. Hmm. A specific line that I earmarked about that was on page 33 about Dean when he's sitting on the train and he says, Dean only realizes he's been stuck underground between stations for 10 minutes after 10 minutes of being stuck underground between stations, which to me felt like, I mean, there might be something deeper there I'm not getting, but it felt like someone tried to hit, a, trying to hit a word count. It felt <laughs> like, uh, like there was no voice behind it, no reason for it. So I don't know. Uh, so you, you just had a sense sometimes that uh, yeah, interesting. That makes sense. Any other other people? Did other people have that kind of sense of a of a struggling for a voice sometimes? Oh, someone here said it was my choice for a turn to decide the book to read for my book club. Um, there were several who commented that the book was not well writ written. The characters were not well written. Uh, oh, I'm losing them because other people, too simple. Someone wondered why it got so much praise, wondered if it got a lot of attention because there aren't many books written by Native Americans. The book club was mostly professional older white women here in San Cruz City. 
Um, interesting. Yeah, I think um, Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say about about like, it's it's always interesting to read a book that's gotten a ton of press, right? And um, it because it builds it up. And I, I know that I have this perverse feeling that when if something gets a ton of press, and I'm like, either I don't want to read it, or I'm super skeptical, when I'm going to read it. But I personally um, was really pleasantly surprised. And I did think I personally felt that it was really well written. Um, and I really admired, uh, I, 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 I admired the way that Tommy Orange was able to create a, um, a world that he was clearly interested in politics and, or social justice um, and in creating this kind of very ambitious multi-character thing happening. But I also wanted to turn the page and I cared about the characters and that is no easy feat. That that's hard to do. It's really hard to do. A lot of people are saying that they loved it more each time they read it. Oh, that's interesting. Somebody said Daniel, Tony, and Bill were not well developed. I mean, I'm. I would also admit that I did. I did. Some of the guys did blend in for me, and I or I would just say there were so many of them that I around the same, I, I imagine them around the same age that it was hard to tell them apart sometimes. Yeah. Well, here it says, please share names of other books written by indigenous women. Oh, um, well, interestingly, I know that Tommy Orange um, has said that he, one of his huge influences was Love Medicine by Louise Erdrich. Um, so that's a great book. Here's someone, oh, definitely Leslie Marmon Silco, Joy Harho, um, Deborah Erling. Here, I'll put her name in the chat. Um, she's a brilliant, really brilliant writer. Yeah, Louise Erdrich is genius. He, he also said The Roundhouse was a big influence by Louise Erdrich as well. Um, that would be great for us to get a list of mm -hmm. Laura the real, real Laura Martin, you probably have a great list of um, of writers that people should read if they want to read more from in Indigenous writers. I do. I'm happy to put it together. We could we could put it out there. Yeah, that would be. That I would just. Be. Yeah, I can do that. I would I just put in the chat too that we read we read Erdrich Love Medicine um, as a kind of precursor. And she does this. She does similar things. Um, and I And I think like I don't know, for me, reading precursors are people who, you know, when writers say this person really influenced me, you can get a real sense of how they crafted, you know, the novel. You have these multi-perspectives. She does interesting things similar with time. Mm -hmm. um, and just the multi-perspective loops that we're sort of in with all these characters. So Erdrich is a big one. I think Silco too. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with gender. If you read um, Love Medicine, there's really um, lots of trauma, lots of representation of trauma um, and a kind of focus on men, but the women come out <laughs> almost, I think Jennifer, you said they, they're kind of stronger um, in this book to some degree or kind of hold everything together that happens in Erdrich, I think too. So I see a lot of echoes there. Yeah, people are putting a lot of great suggestions here in the chat as well of, of things that you might want to read. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I love, I love book recommendations. Well, um, as we're as we're kind of uh, winding down a little bit, do people have? Does anybody have um, thing other things that they want to make sure that we bring up or discuss around the craft of? Um, there, there. What does just, wait, oh, that's a book, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, do people have um, things that we haven't talked about yet? Oh, here, are 3D printed firearms in this story more of a gimmick or something more symbolic? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Or just something real. Yeah, they they are real. Yeah, I th I think that w one of the things I found really cool is the way Tommy Orange uses the drone. 
um, it's actually, now I think about it, it's Jennifer, you're, you're brilliant because it's like, he's using that drone in a lot of the same ways that you were talking about in terms of the objects in that um, the drone isn't just one thing. It's not like, oh, evil drone, bad, bad, only bad, simple. It's like the drone is in its own way, a kind of eye or storyteller that's, that's, you know, looking and it's also ends up being a kind of saves the day um, in a little bit in, in the, or, or is a, a tool for um, saving somebody. So it's, but it's also obviously, you know, a tool for surveillance and, and um, creepy too. So it's, it's doing a lot of different things. I, I, I like that um, about it. Ooh, someone says the drone reminded me of Eagle Vision. Uh-huh. Yeah, and again, I think that's so, I, I think it's a, I think all over that book, um, Tommy Orange is insisting on indigeneity or Indianness as being not, is being contemporary. That's something that's happening in the present, right? Where there's drones and 3D guns and video games and, um, in that it's not, it's not something that's past, right? Yeah. Well, I think we're, I think we're kind of out of time actually. Yeah, it's just so, it was so, um, so lovely to see all of you here. It's just really warms my heart to see so many readers in one room and careful readers careful readers really, really good readers. comments <laughs>